Hi, and welcome to our final, as in very last, health communication summary lecture. Today we're going to continue talking about entertainment education. Last time we were talking about um, mostly entertainment education in different parts of the world, different types of programs that have been created, um, soap operas, radio programs, those types of things. Um, that have been implemented in other countries to try to get people to change health behaviors or their attitudes about different social issues. Um, today, I just wanted to focus a little bit on how these uh, same types of strategies are being used in the United States. Um, the United States is a little bit different. Um, in many ways, actually, believe it or not, it's a lot easier to implement entertainment education campaigns in other countries. Um, I don't mean to oversimplify it. There's complications whenever you do something like this. But because the uh, United States is such a media-saturated environment, right, um, because people in the United States and other Western countries, too, have so many available media options, it's really hard to target specific audiences, right? Um, so if I have a message that um, is targeted at a particular community, for instance, it, it wouldn't be very effective to um, try to develop a TV series, you know, to do that because people are um, choosing among many different cable stations and also different types of media options. Um, this is actually one reason why people have um, developed more of an interest in trying to use video games to um, for health messages. Video games, like uh, the Darfur is Dying game, for instance, we talked about last time. Uh, one of the advantages is like that it can kind of penetrate that. Um, the mass communication media environment and since we can put these things online and make them more easily available that the people that need to get the messages might actually be drawn to them. Um, but in thinking about traditional media, again, radio, television, things like that, um, there being so many options does make it a little bit difficult to put together a, a solid EE campaign, um, whereas if you're working in um, a, a smaller country with less uh, media options, it actually can work out better for your targeted message. Um, another problem with the United States is that um, it's very expensive to do entertainment programming that people want to watch in the United States, right? So even if you could sort of like cut through because you've got the best show with the best health messages and things like that, it's uh, really, really expensive, right? And also there's this um, emphasis on ratings, of course, and um, Networks are not necessarily networks, cable, um, ca cable stations. Nobody's going to be really interested in promoting health communication for the sake of health communication. Of course, w what everybody's interested in is getting the ratings because that's what gives people advertising dollars. Um, so really the cost of producing and um, the complications with actually trying to have like a hit show, right? Um, including with radio, but specifically with television, makes it a lot more complica compli complicated to implement these entertainment education programs uh, in the likes that we've seen and all of the examples that you're reading um, from the last time talked about. But as you can see this week, we actually do have still several examples of entertainment education in the United States. Um, one of the big differences, though, is because you don't normally see serialized programming. You don't usually see shows that are designed with the purpose of education. Um, and I'm not talking about PBS types of um, you know, documentary shows, because again, that might not necessarily qualify as entertainment education if we're thinking about weaving something that's meant to be entertainment with, you know, some sort of persuasive health message. Um, but there are exceptions. Um, one exception I can think of is Sesame Street, um, something we're probably all familiar with. Sesame Street was developed with the purpose, remember the traditional uh, definition of entertainment education is that it's a purposeful integration of entertainment and uh, education. And Sesame Street was developed with the intention of helping um, sort of close an education gap between um, higher achieving students and lower achieving students who were in low income houses, um, urban minority children who might not have been as ready for kindergarten as um, their white middle class counterparts, um, which is why Sesame Street it takes place in an urban environment, right? And it's got a diverse cast of Muppets, right? Because uh, that's really what, what the target was. And th that's a, actually kind of an exception because that was a program that um, its sole purpose was entertainment education. But normally we don't see that. Um, it does seem like PBS is the only type of place that, that could even um, happen if it were to happen. Um, Again, I, I, there are always exceptions, but I'm just sort of trying to impress that to actually see a program that fits that campaign sort of feel 
of the other entertainment education initiatives we've talked about is rare. So what you normally see in the U.S. is efforts to embed health messages in television shows or radio programs or whatever that are already there. So you might not see um, ER, for example, which is, is talked about uh, quite a bit. Um, ER was a program that was, you know, exploring all sorts of dramatic situations in, the, in an emergency room. I know, I'm sorry that these examples are kind of dated, but they're still really cool, right? Um, anyway, uh, it's not like that program, you know, Michael Creighton developed it to teach people about medicine or um, any sort of health messages. But uh, that doesn't mean that people couldn't learn from certain messages, um, sort of like an unintentional entertainment education. Uh, but uh, in addition to that, there's also efforts that go on quite frequently to get positive health messages deliberately inserted into these existing programs. Um, your reading talks about um, Hollywood Health and Society, which is uh, an organization I'm a big fan of. You can actually look up some of the things that they do by going to the CDC website or just type in Hollywood Health and Society. You'll get all sorts of examples of things that they've done. They partner with um, other organizations, Norman Lear Center, um, University of Southern California, and, and really they are um, a resource organization. Uh, sometimes these messages get in there because people will go and advocate to have certain messages put in there. Um, that's actually not what Hollywood Health and Society does. What they try to do is um, they just try to make themselves available. Say, we have this service. If you are a writer and you would like to make sure that the information you're putting in your um, in your program is accurate, uh, we can help with that. We can provide you with materials and consultants. Um, if uh, there's some sort of cause you would like to work on, right, we could do uh, help you with that too. So they don't really go out of their way to force themselves on Hollywood writers, um, but they they're supposed to be sort of like, I guess you could say, the entertainment education librarians, right? The um, they're really supposed to act as a resource. Um, but sometimes, as you found out, sometimes what happens is that there'll be a health campaign that will also go to and approach different uh, writers or producers of shows, maybe multiple shows. So you'll see the same message come up um, across different shows, even across different networks, um, which is kind of a smart transmedia way of getting things done. Um, but yeah, so there, there's a couple different ways that these messages um, can get inserted. Um, <clears throat> I am, as I mentioned before, kind of disappointed that uh, all of these examples were dated, but I, I will say I was kind of biased. One of the reasons I wanted to even assign this reading is because it mentions one of my favorite examples, which if any of you guys um, remember Friends, which was a sitcom that was on several years ago, um, it was about the lives of single people who, of course, got together and got married and became less single as the time went on and they broke up again, you know, that type of thing. Um, but it, it followed the lives of um, some single friends, and um, one of the episodes... Um, focused on uh, an accidental pregnancy. So one of the main characters, Rachel, uh, was accidentally impregnated by Ross, another main character, and the entire episode is about uh, how that could happen because they used a condom. And um, the message that was repeated, right, um, it was very well planned actually, repeated over and over again throughout it in a very comedic fashion that uh, Ross comes to find out that by looking at the condom box and calling the condom company that condoms are actually only 95% effective. So there's 5% ineffectiveness. Um, and it, again, hilarity ensues while he's like sort of, you know, uh, dealing with this and grappling with the implications. But in the meantime, the audience is getting the message that condoms are not 100% uh, safe, um, that things can still happen. And it, it's a health message that people might not have known. One of the things I really like about that is that um, it, you'll notice that the findings also really speak to the importance of interpersonal communication. And if you remember when we talked last time, one of the really um, neat things about entertainment education is because things are entertaining, um, it encourages people to talk about them more because people like talking about things that they enjoyed. And um, what they found in studies that sort of came out to assess whether or not that message about the 95% effectiveness rate had any effect was they found that teenagers who uh, discussed this, who discussed that episode with their parents, um, it said, uh, let me get the exact statistics, 47% of teens who discussed this episode with parents actually remember that message uh, about the 95% effectiveness. And a lot of these evaluations, you know, they, they won't just look at um, short-term, like immediately after the episode, um, they'll actually look at long-term remembrance. Um, 
which is pretty significant, right? Not if you can just change somebody's mind in the moment and they're going to forget about it later, but if you can actually enact long-term changes. Um, and that's actually kind of the final thing I wanted to, um, I think, yeah, the final thing I wanted to kind of bring up about all this is uh, how do we measure the impact of entertainment education? Remember, just like uh, regular health campaigns, public health campaigns, ad campaigns, those types of things, entertainment education um, is very systematic in how it goes about uh, figuring out the best way to embed a message in the entertainment, the best way to reach the audience, and then uh, throughout it, um, throughout the actual initiative, you know, there has to be a lot of evaluation and finally some final assessment or evaluation at the end to see if it had any effects, how it worked, those types of things. And there's a couple ways it can be done and what I actually really liked about um, this reading also, even though it was just a lot of examples, if you look you can see lots of different ways that they try to figure out what effect different um, EE messages entertainment education had on people, surveys a really popular method, right? You can always, um, if you have survey data before, let's say, an episode airs, uh, you can compare that to w how people respond, um, what people's attitudes or beliefs about a particular health behavior after the episode airs. Um, but the cool thing is, is you don't even need to necessarily have pre-measure data and post-measure data. You don't actually have to have people take a survey before they watch an entertainment education show or after. Um, in fact, I'll, it could be as simple as just comparing people who were exposed to a message to um, people who weren't. So everybody that saw the Friends episode, comparing them to people who didn't see the Friends episode. Um, the only thing that you have to watch out for, because people do talk about you know, the shows that they watch, is that there's not some interpersonal carryover effects. But even that you can um, probe and you can actually ask people if they've discussed it with anyone. Um, the other cool thing, um, is when you can actually see uh, people's information seeking behaviors after they watch one of these programs. Uh, so you can look at call center or hotline data. Let's say there was an episode about like suicide prevention. Um, and, uh, oh, I was just thinking about like the death of Robin Williams, right? Where, uh, you know, there was a lot of discussion about like his depression um, and his suicide. And um, I don't have the data, but wouldn't it be interesting to see um, how his death uh, actually spiked different um, calls for people that were trying to find more information. I realize it's kind of a stretch from entertainment education, although celebrities sort of tie into all this too. In fact, Magic Johnson, um, he's one of the more famous cases that we have a lot of data on. Uh, it was very neat before he made his announcement that he was HIV positive in the early 90s. Um, there was just this base rate of people who called um, an HIV hotline that I think the CDC had open. And then when um, my, he went on television and uh, announced that he um, was HIV positive, you could actually see like this, you know, growth and how many people were calling. I think um, one of the things I read said that like, you know, it was actually a little problematic because they weren't prepared to handle that much volume. Anyway, again, I don't mean to get away from the entertainment education thing, although I do like kind of teasing um, other interesting health communication topics like how celebrities, uh, because they too are entertaining, can affect um, our health uh, uh, beliefs and the things that we want to know. Um, they're also very relatable, but um, the same thing is also something that um, can really let us see how much the programs that we're watching can actually affect our um, attitudes about whatever is being discussed. Um, the only thing I want to close with is more of a teaser that maybe we can get into a little bit more in the discussion board, which is, um, I kind of mentioned before that one of Hollywood Health and Society's um, primary goals was to help make sure that accurate information is put into uh, different programs, accurate health information, um, or pro-social messages. Um, but, you know, we, we've talked a lot about like reasons that entertainment education is really good for helping people learn or sparking people's interest and, and so forth, but um, that might not always be a good thing if there are inaccurate messages that are in the media. So, um, I guess you could say counter entertainment education outcomes. Um, I'm actually in my head thinking about some controversy about some Grey's Anatomy uh, portrayals that maybe weren't very accurate. Thing, um, one of them, um, I remember very early on in the series, I don't watch the series, uh, don't hate me for the fans. I really, I, it's true, I really don't like the series. But uh, I studied this one a lot actually. There was a Grey's Anatomy episode where uh, they gave the impression that people who um, donate organs will be put to death sooner and everything. And that was um, P. 
people who study entertainment education were sort of upset about that because it was a very inaccurate, you know, health message, the way that they portrayed this in the drama. So um, just a little example, but I would be really interested to hear about um, more recent examples because these are kind of dated. That's a downside. More recent examples of either entertainment education, or I guess we can call it counter entertainment education that you've encountered um, and how you think it's affected you or other people, or maybe not. So We'll talk about that a little bit later, hopefully, but thank you. It's been a wonderful semester. Um, I look forward to um, seeing all your final papers and hopefully keeping in touch with you in the future. Bye.